Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 19th of August and this quick look at the week ahead with me, Michael Hewson. Um, it's been a fairly resilient week for stock markets in general, which I think is altogether surprising when you actually look at some of the data that we've seen uh, this week. Um, new homes, existing home sales in the US continue to look weak. They've declined for six months out of the last seven. UK inflation at another record high, the CPI that is, at 10.1%, although um, on the plus side at least wages appear to be heading in the right direction, albeit at very much half the level of the headline CPI rate, which essentially means that in real terms um, consumers here in the UK are taking a pay cut of around about 4 or 5%. That obviously is being fed out into a collapse in consumer confidence for August, fell to a new record low of minus 44. Um, but retail sales in July did see a little bit of a modest pickup against most expectations that we were going to see a decline of 0.3%. What we actually saw was a rise of 0.3%. That hasn't been enough to help the pound. The pound still looks very weak. It's now down below 120 and rather calls into question that inverse head and shoulders pattern that I've been pointing at that I was pointing out just over a week ago but it, but essentially that was always a pattern that was only going to become valid if we broke above the neckline the fact that we haven't done that suggests that we could be on course for further sterling weakness but it's not just the pound that's coming under pressure um, it's pretty much every single currency against the US dollar, which has become newly resurgent once more. Um, having said that, I think there is still an expectation on the part of some investors that the Fed will reserve will be forced to pivot when it comes to monetary policy, i.e. they will be forced to start cutting rates sometime in 2023. Now, personally, I think that argument is complete nonsense. Um, I think investors really need to start getting a grip when it comes to this expectation that somehow the Fed will start cutting rates. Now, that's not to say that the Fed will pour, won't pause. Yeah, they will. They'll pause eventually because the economy will slow to such an extent that they won't feel the need to start hiking rates anymore and ultimately inflation will come down and while US inflation does appear to have shown some signs of leveling off and rolling over a large part of that has been largely down to the fact that gasoline prices in the US have fallen quite sharply from their highs um, back in June um, May, in May and June um, on a much broader level inflationary pressures are still very much um, very much apparent and there's certainly a lot more apparent here in Europe if you look at German PPI for July that surged 5.3 percent month on month and 37.2 percent year on year in July and that's largely as a consequence of continued surges in natural gas prices. Um, if we look at the UK natural gas prices, they're back at 500, you know, they're, they're back at levels that we last saw back in March, record highs. And also European natural gas prices, which obviously I don't have a chart of, they are also back at record highs and continuing to go higher as European countries continue to try and build up their reserves ahead of the winter and that's really what is driving prices higher at the moment there's this big rush to build gas reserves up um, before you know the expectation perhaps that Putin will will cut off um, European natural gas supplies so that's helping to push prices up obviously UK inflation is also high raising expectations the Bank of England will go by 50 basis points in September on the margin this is this is uk this is uk two-year gilt yields um taking out the previous peaks bets are continuing to rise and that is likely to see further rate rises with 200 basis points of rate hikes 
being priced in for next year. Um, personally, I'm skeptical, a little bit skeptical about the prospect of that happening, given how conservative with a small c um, the Bank of England has tended to be. Having said that, we've just come off the back of 150 basis point rate hike. And ultimately, given the direction of travel when it comes to headline inflation and given the direction of travel when it comes to um, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England probably won't have any choice but to basically follow the Fed and at least try and keep track. Um, and I think the bigger question at the moment is not really a question of how much will the Bank of England hike rates in, hike rates in September, what will the Fed do? And that was, I think that's the discussion that markets are having at the moment. This week's Fed minutes didn't really add to the sum of overall knowledge about the Fed's intentions when it came or when it comes to um, a rate hike in September. The debate is over by how much. The recent softening of US data, when I say softening, I mean in terms of higher inflation, um, a drop in weekly jobless claims has, I think, on the margins generated some discussion about the possibility the Fed might be tempted to go by 25 basis points in September. That doesn't really tie in with the narrative that's coming from a number of Fed speakers. Let's look at where the Fed funds rate is right now. It's 2.25 to 2.5 percent. Many Fed speakers have said they want to see it at 3.75 to 4 percent by year end. OK, so that's another 150 basis points of hikes between now and the end of December. There's three Fed meetings between now and the end of the year. The first one is in September. The second one is the beginning of November. And the last one is just before Christmas in December. So if you're going to get 150 basis points of rate hikes in between now and then, you need to at least you need to at least see one 75 basis point rate hike in that period. That suggests to me that we will see that in September. Certainly, I think the comments from Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed, Lester George of the Kansas City Fed, James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, and Neil Kashkari, who generally tends to be more, uh, more of a dovish side of things, suggests that the Fed wants to front load their rate hikes. So I think irrespective of the fact that we saw a little bit of softening of CPI in the July numbers and the August numbers come during the Fed blackout period, I think it's more than likely the Fed will do 75 in September. The markets aren't pricing that, they're pricing 50. And we've got the Jackson Hole Symposium coming up this week. And I think that's really the, the, the main item on the economic agenda that um, policymakers, investors, traders, will be looking at in terms of the direction of travel for US monetary policy as we head into the winter months. There's still too much chatter about the prospect of a pivot. And I think Powell has the opportunity to really let the air out of that bubble and knock it firmly on the head. Is it realistic to think that with inflation at current levels, that the Federal Reserve will start to cut rates in 2023. Let's think about that for a minute, okay? Inflation is at 8.5%. Even if it falls by half of that, do you think it's remotely credible that the Fed will start to cut rates when their inflation target is at 2%? Inflation is not going to be back at 2% next year. So why are the markets pricing in a pivot? It just makes no sense whatsoever. With inflation here in the UK at over 10%, you know, is it really credible that all of those pressures are going to subside between now and next year, given the current economic? I just can't see it. I really can't see it. So it really absolutely staggers me that people are pricing in the prospect of some sort of pivot in the expectation that the Fed will bottle it when equity markets start to roll over. Um, certainly, they've been fairly resilient, and we can see that on the S&P 500. But look where we are right now. now. I posted this chart on Twitter earlier this week, and we are still below the downtrend line. We're below the 200-day moving average, and we do appear to be looking like we may well have topped out in the short to medium term. So at the moment, 
we still remain very much in a downtrend that we've been in since the beginning of the year. Nothing that I have seen over the course of the past few weeks and months has changed my mind about the direction of travel when it comes to equity markets more broadly. It's always about trading the price, trading what you see. And yes, we did break above these previous peaks here, but what's significant is we're still in this downtrend and we're still below the 200 day moving average. I would only be tempted to revise my opinion if we broke above both of those key levels going forward. Same applies to the German DAX. Again, similar sort of story. These are the highs this year. We're below the 200 day moving average. We're below the downtrend line from the peaks this year. We are now starting to show signs of rolling over. That potentially looks like a bearish reversal. If we do start to roll over further, then I think there's a good chance we could start to roll back towards the lows. So I think markets are underestimating the possibility um, that markets will be anywhere near as resilient as they have been. And at the moment we are in August, we're not in September. So an awful lot of people are still on holiday. There's not really been a catalyst per se to really knock stocks off their highs. So essentially, it's still very much a case of selling to strength until those key technical levels on the upside have been broken. Obviously, the dollar is also pushing higher. That is obviously feeding in to the bearish narrative. You know, people don't generally buy the dollar if they're um, if they're feeling particularly, um, you know, sort of risk on. They generally tend to buy the dollar if they're risk averse. And certainly this euro dollar chart appears to tell me that we're still very much heading back towards parity and potentially below that. And need I remind you from something that I said back in April that we could well see further euro dollar declines over the course of the next few weeks and months. And certainly the initial target for euro dollar still remains for me 0.9620 while we're below 103.40. And those peaks that we saw um, earlier this month. So nothing's changed on my euro dollar view. Still remain very much of a lower euro dollar. I'm probably going to have to revise my cable view. That is starting to look very, very vulnerable now. Um, you know, this was the potential inverse head and shoulders. The fact that we've taken out this low here suggests that we're probably going to take out this low here as well at some point. 117.60 is that low there. Um, the next target, I think, really, you're looking back at the lows that we saw um, post lockdown around about 114, 115. But in the short to medium term, this doesn't look promising for cable. And in the short to medium term, if we break below 117.60, then we're potentially looking at 115 in the same way that we're looking at a euro dollar. Euro sterling, it's retesting those peaks again, 85, 84, 84, 80, 85. You've also got, obviously got these peaks back in July as well, um, which are likely to act as a bit of a bit of resistance. But overall, we still very much remain in a range for euro sterling. I see no reason to revise that. It's not really going anywhere. It's just playing the sides more than anything else when it comes to euro sterling. Dollar yen, it's broken higher again. Likelihood is we're probably going to see further dollar strength, further yen losses, and potentially retest those peaks back at 138, um, 139.40 back in July on the basis of the fact that um, the US economy is probably going to be the last uh, of the uh, the major economies to really feel the effects of the prices, the higher prices that are affecting investors, consumers, and pretty much everyone else here in Europe. US natural gas prices are still very much lower than European prices and UK prices. And that I think is ameliorating some of the pain that US consumers are going to feel relative to consumers here in the UK. So Jackson Hole, that's really, I think, the, 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 main, the main event this week. We do have second quarter GDP numbers out of the US. They're not really expected to tell us anything new. They are, the US is in a technical 
recession, even if it's not universally acknowledged that the US is in a recession. Apparently there is a difference. Um, but you know whether or not we see a revision to the not minus 0.9% contraction in Q2 is neither here nor there. We've also got US PCE core deflator, which is the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. And um, that that did that core PCE did jump to a record high of 6.8% in June. There is a possibility we could see that soften a little bit, but it still remains awfully high. And as I said earlier, it's unlikely that the Fed will soften its language. And as and as I also said, Powell has the opportunity to prick the misconception that the Fed will be cutting rates in 2023. I really can't see that happening. And you've really only got to look at the numbers to understand how unlikely that is likely to be. I certainly don't think markets have fully digested that. We've also got the Germany IFO business climate for August. That's likely to be a very ugly number, given the direction of power prices that we've seen since July. They've gone up even further. German businesses are unlikely to be particularly happy about that. In terms of Brent crude prices, there is some good news, certainly I think for um, us hard pressed drivers. These are starting to come down, even if natural gas prices are not. And that, in essence, does buy us a little bit of respite at the pump. I filled up my car only yesterday and paid 167, which is probably the lowest price I've paid for about um, two months now. So still, it's still, still expensive, but certainly not as expensive as it was when I was paying 189, 190 a few weeks ago. And certainly direction of travel in Brent crude does appear to suggest we may have hit a short term bottom. Um, certainly the, the formation of this candle here and obviously this trend line through here suggests that we could, we could be heading towards the lower end of the recent range. Nonetheless, it is encouraging that we are trending lower, even if natural gas prices are not. Maybe we should all go out and get oil fired boilers and not gas fired ones. Um, that was a joke, by the way, in case you're wondering. Um, in terms of numbers, company numbers, um, there's not really that much on the docket. Obviously, NVIDIA and Peloton. We've also got Harbor Energy. Now, why have I picked Harbor Energy? Because Harbor Energy um, is one of those companies that you've probably never heard of but it's very, very important um, when you talk about the obscene profits being made by big oil and gas companies um, due to surging oil and gas prices. It gets forgotten that companies like Harbour Energy are very much a UK-based company. It was formed out of the ashes of Premier Oil and Chrysale, and it's still carrying the legacy of that debt to the tune of £2.8 billion as at the end of last year. Now, the announcement of the windfall tax saw the shares in Harbour fall quite sharply. You can see that here. Um, and last year, the company managed to generate annual revenues of £3.48 billion. Pounds. Now, that ex that's expected to rise, not surprisingly, to around about £5.18 billion. Pounds. But it gets 90% of its production through five key UK hubs. And we need companies like Harbour Energy to um, put money into new natural gas assets. They have got a field called the Tollmount Gas Field, which they've just managed to bring online, and it's which increased UK gas output by 5%. It's also started to look outside the UK um, to try and make some money simply because of the fact that it is so UK exposed. Now, in my opinion, for what it's worth, we should be encouraging companies like these to invest in new natural gas assets in the North Sea, not whacking 80% or 65% windfall taxes on them. Because if they're paying 65% in taxes, they're not investing in UK natural gas. But what do I know? And, you know, at a time when the UK needs all the investment it can get when it comes to its energy security, the UK government and the UK opposition seem intent on driving that energy away. It's absolutely mind-bogglingly mind -bogglingly moronic. But what can you do? What can you do? Anyway, they, they, those, those, they, 
those first half numbers for Harbour Energy are due out on the first half um, uh, of due out um, this week. We've also got um, NVIDIA, which earlier this month issued a profits warning on its latest Q2 numbers. So that a large part of that is already in the price. Uh, you can see that that's, that's where we saw the profit warning. We've since rebounded quite a bit on the back of that. The company blamed events in China as well as the Russia situation, which played a part in the downgrade to their outlook. Um, as I say, they, they're expecting to see their Q2 revenues fall to $6.7 billion, which was basically down from a consensus estimate of around about $8 billion when they reported back in Q1. Now, what could happen here is that like Walmart, they could have decided to kitchen sink their expectations in the hope that when they beat later this week, or if they beat later this week, the shares will pop higher. It'll be interesting to see if that is what happens when they report on the 24th of August. But last but not least, that basket case Peloton, seen a bit of a rebound in the past few days, but when you zoom the chart out, it doesn't look like that much of a rebound, does it? No, maybe not. Um, so, as I say, we've seen solid, gain, solid gains in the past two weeks. The share price did hit a record low in July. For Q4, um, it's going to be very interesting to see um, whether or not they meet the very low bar for Q4. They expect to see revenues of $675 million to $700 million, uh, EBITDA losses of $115 million to $120 million. So they've announced 800 job cuts. They're outsourcing all their deliveries, and they're also raising prices by 25 to 30%, reversing the price cuts of earlier this year. Now, this does seem slightly counterintuitive to me because if you're heading into a cost of living crisis, um, people aren't going to want to buy two grand bikes, you know, or, or expensive monthly subscriptions to Peloton fitness classes. So, you know, I, I can't help thinking that perhaps that's not the wisest things to do. In any case, losses are expected to come in at 75 cents a share on Peloton's Q4 numbers, which are due on the 25th of August. Okay, so I'm pretty certain that is all for this week. Once again, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend. Now that the weather's cooled down a bit, hopefully we won't be um, sweating as much and we'll get hopefully get to enjoy the weekend in a much more pleasant fashion. But have a nice weekend and I'll speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thanks for listening.